By the mid-60s, support for the SNP was increasing. Labour Secretary of State for Scotland, Willie Ross, wanted to keep them on the fringes. A Scottish office memo of the time reads... The Secretary of State is concerned about correspondence with the Scottish National Party and has requested that replies to their letters should be as brief as possible. Where appropriate, the letter should simply be acknowledged. Winifred Margaret Ewing, Scottish National 18,390... But the Nationalists could not be fobbed off for long. In 1967, the SNP's winning Ewan won the staunchly Labour Hamilton constituency in a by-election. Scottish politics were never to be the same again. Labour and Tories both began exploring ways which might satisfy Scottish demands for a degree of self-government while maintaining the Union. Could devolution finally be on the horizon? 1970 was another year of political upheaval against almost all predictions the Tories won the general election that June, and although winning Ewan lost Hamilton, Donald Stewart became the first SNP candidate to win a seat from the general election when he won the Western Isles from Labour. Devolution was now in the hands of Ted Heath, but the issue seriously divided the two main parties. Labour and Conservatives both split into pro- and anti-devolution factions. And even if they wanted pro-devolution, devolution of how much power? The political debate was often heated, but in 1970 it became oil-fired. In October that year, just four months after the Tories won the general election, BP struck oil in the North Sea, 110 miles east of Aberdeen. It was the giant Forties field. In September 1972, the SNP launched the is Scotland's oil campaign. The party's membership soared. In 1973, a Royal Commission examining the possibility of devolution recommended that Scotland get a directly elected assembly, but with limited powers. A week later, this happens. Margot MacDonald of the SNP won the staunch Labour seat in Glasgow's govern. The mixture of nationalism, devolution and oil worried the government. Behind the political scenes, senior departments of energy civil servants were busy trying to defend the status quo. The case for not devolving responsibility seems to be overwhelming. Licensing policy must remain in the hands of central government. We recommend that it would not be consistent with the political and economic unity of the United Kingdom at large to devolve legislative responsibility for oil and gas developments to the regions. The exploration and exploitation of our oil and gas resources need to be considered in the light of our national and international policies. The thing about the civil service is that no department likes giving up its functions. And so in the Scottish office, I mean, we had frequent meetings with our counterparts in other departments discussing what sort of functions a devolved government in Scotland might have. And most departments start from the position that they didn't want to give up any functions. In 1974, the Wheel of Fortune turned again. Ted Heath's Conservatives lost the election to Harold Wilson's Labour Party. Now Wilson was responsible for deciding what share of oil revenues might come to Scotland. One Scottish office civil servant warned. It could be argued that so long as Scotland is an integral part of the United Kingdom, serious damage would be done to the principles of parity of treatment if special expenditures were directed to Scotland only. The government feared that devolution for Scotland would mean that not only would there be conflict between the oil companies but also between Scotland and Britain. In July 1975, a Scottish office official warned To provide a directly elected assembly in Scotland with a real or simulated sense of grievance over the handling of oil would provide a focus for national discontent particularly since oil has now made plausible the possibility of full Scottish independence. A Treasury report marked confidential shows that senior civil servants were beginning to think the unthinkable. North Sea oil completely changes the picture for Scotland. 
First, there is a plausible case for arguing that it is Scottish. In October 1974, Labour won another general election with an increased majority, but the SNP won another five seats, bringing their strength up to 11 MPs. In the face of the growing nationalist threat, the Queen announced Labour's devolution plans. My government will urgently prepare for the implementation of the decision to set up directly elected assemblies in Scotland and Wales. My impression was that um, Labour ministers realised, because of the greatly increased vote for the SNP, so there was a demand for some form of self-government in Scotland, and they thought they had to meet that. But within weeks of the Queen's speech, grave doubts about devolution were coming from a senior civil servant in the Cabinet Office. What if the Scottish Assembly wanted to take control of the oil? The Scottish administration might wish deliberately to restrict the programme in order to husband reserves, or, more generally, to frustrate the central government. This could happen if the SNP gained a majority or a dominant influence in the Assembly. The risk underlies the whole devolution settlement, and if it were to materialise, it would mark the failure of the government's devolution strategy. For the government, this was a serious problem, according to Cabinet Minister Tony Benn's members. Scottish Secretary Willie Ross told the Cabinet Committee that the Scottish devolution was the most important decision since 1707. Meanwhile, it was dawning on the government that an independent Scotland might be very rich. But North Sea Oil was increasingly seen as the UK's economic lifeline. It was a very bad time as far as the rest of the economy was concerned. I mean, the shipbuilding industry was in, in pretty dire straits at that time. Much of it was disappearing. And uh, steel and heavy engineering, these other industries, traditional industries of Scotland, were also in decline. So it was, a, it was a depressing time from the point of view of the economy. And of course, the whole of the United Kingdom was suffering from tremendously high inflation and, and, and unemployment. Oil devolution was a complex problem, but the government quite a simple strategy. They wouldn't tell the Scots that North Sea oil riches were vast. Gavin Macron was chief economic advisor to the Scottish office at the time. In the paper he wrote early in 1974, he reveals that the government claimed that the oil was worth a hundred million a year, but the SNP claimed it was worth 800 million a year. Macron concluded, The only thing that is wrong with the SNP estimate is that it is far too low. I thought folk needed to be woken up a bit. Uh, and it was actually a briefing paper for the incoming ministers in the government in 1974, uh, because I felt that the, up to that time, the official estimates of the revenues of North Sea Isle had grossly underestimated what it would amount to. This is the Macron document, the best informed analysis of the potential of North Sea oil that the government had. The, this must have terrified the government and the unionist opposition. For a start, it brushed aside claims that North Sea oil might not legally belong to Scotland. It is hard to see any conclusion other than to allow Scotland to have that part of the continental shelf which would have been hers if she had been independent all along. Macron then turns to the economy of an independent Scotland. On the next page he says, It must be concluded, therefore, that large revenues and balance of payments gains would indeed accrue to a Scottish government in the event of independence. The country would tend to be in chronic surplus to a quite embarrassing degree, and its currency would become the hardest in Europe. The Scottish pound would be seen as a good hedge against inflation and devaluation, and the Scottish banks could expect to find themselves inundated with a speculative inflow of foreign funds. Macron then argues that the idea of an independent Scotland being refused EEC membership is a non-starter. North Sea Oil could have far-reaching consequences for Scottish membership of the EEC because of the tremendously increased political power it would confer as the major producer of oil in Western Europe. Scotland would be in a key position 
and other countries would be extremely foolish if they did not seek to do all they could to accommodate Scottish interests. The government paid civil servants then came to the conclusion that the government didn't want to hear and certainly didn't want Scotland to hear. This paper has shown that the advent of North Sea oil has completely overturned the traditional economic arguments used against Scottish nationalism. For the first time since the Act of Union was passed, it can now be credibly argued that Scotland's economic advantage lies in its repeal. So how did the government deal with this evidence from the distinguished economist? Simple. They marked it secret and buried it for 30 years here in the National Archive of Scotland. The truth about the amount of oil that lay in the North Sea and the wealth it could create for an independent Scotland was kept hidden for years. In 1977, Berwick upon Tweed, a town historically much fought over between Scotland and England, became central to a new campaign by the civil servants of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. They thought they'd found a way of taking the oil away from Scotland altogether. They wanted to redraw the offshore border between Scotland and England, so that it now ran north-east, not due east, from Berwick-on-Tweed. They also wanted to encourage Shetland and Orkney to opt out of any future independent Scotland. Writing to Prime Minister Callaghan, Foreign Secretary Anthony Gra Grossland claimed that the recognised border due east of Berwick-on-Tweed would never stand international scrutiny and goes in to suggest seeking to inspire articles with selected public opinion formers and briefing backbench MPs. Grossland's civil servants advised the Prime Minister However the dividing line was drawn, it would give England a considerable area of what are now Scottish waters. It might also have the effect of putting into English waters a certain amount and possibly even a great deal of oil. The Foreign Office officers go on to urge HMG to play Shetland Orkney card as the islanders were dead set against being run from Edinburgh. They and their oil would remain British because... Seems inconceivable that Her Majesty's government would exclude the Shetlands from the UK against their will in the event of Scottish independence. That way Scotland would be left with very little oil. Shetland, Orkney and England would have it all. The Foreign Office plan to redraw the border was circulated to ministers and departments. Bernard Ingram, who was then a senior professor, press officer at the Department of Energy claimed that he and his colleagues had been peddling that line for ages. Information Division has sought for a long time in briefing to undermine SNP claims to North Sea oil. In the process, it has played on the Shetland Orkney uncertainty as well as the uncertainty about the angle of any dividing line between England and a hypothetically independent Scotland. Indeed, Agrasho, is part of my standard sales pattern. I think possibly, looking back on the whole thing, that there were those in the civil service who took a rather different view of this from what they would normally do of political issues, because they felt that they had to work for the maintenance of the integrity of the United Kingdom. I think that was seen as a, an objective by some people. Not only did Westminster believe that it was them and only them that had the right to North Sea oil and its revenues, they also had definite ideas about how the windfall should be spent. Brian Willett, a senior civil servant from the Department of Industry, wrote to Gavin McCrone. North Sea oil revenues could be used for the improvement of the North and South Circular roads to motorway standards and to build an outer ring road. Building of the proposed channel tunnel might be reconsidered. Rucker Macron, the notion that North Sea oil revenues could be used for the improvement of the North and South Circular roads may well appeal to the commuting civil servant, but it would be political suicide for any government that was anxious to retain seats in Scotland. Macron may have had right on his side, but Willard had might on his. Over the next 30 years, the oil flowed and the hugely expensive outer ring road, the M25, was built. 
as was the equally expensive Channel Tunnel. Scotland, meanwhile, saw industry after industry being closed down. Don't let them do it again. Fought yes in September 2014 and free our country from Westminster control.